Hey everyone, thank you for taking the time to join us this week for Echo Online. We're glad that you're here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Duncan and I am one of the young adults here at NWBC and we're glad that you could be with us. Look, you probably know by now that if you've been following what Echo has been doing, um, we have been meeting entirely online uh, during this season that we have been doing uh, meetings where we catch up with, with each other via video calls on Messenger and things like that. And uh, we've also been putting out these videos for you guys uh, every fortnight and uh, really, I guess, anyone who wants to watch it on YouTube. Um, and it's required us to learn a different way of doing things. It's required us to, to adapt to how we have to do things a little bit differently. But surely, if there is any group of people who is able to adapt to connecting online, it's the young adults, you know. People refer to us as the connected generation. And just this past uh, fortnight, I finally had the chance to look at a study that I've been trying to uh, look at for, for a little while now, and uh, it's actually called the connected generation. And it's a study that is put out by an organization called the Barna Group, uh, where they interviewed uh, 15,000 369 young adults, people between the ages of 18 and 35, from 25 different countries. And they interviewed them about the idea of identity, about the idea of uh, spirituality and, and Christianity. And they got them to respond to certain questions. And, and I just wanted to start this message by um, sharing with you some of the results, I guess, from that, from that study that really stood out to me. They say that only 56%, only half of young adults feel secure in who they are. Just one in three or 33% of young adults say that they feel deeply cared about by those around them. So only 33% of young adults feel like they're actually deeply cared about by the people around them. And this one will really stood out to me. Almost half of young adults who have left Christianity have seen it as hypocritical compared to three in 10 of those who've never been Christian. You know what that means? That means that the people who have experienced Christianity, the people who have been Christians themselves, the people who have had proximity with Christians, they're more likely to have seen hypocrisy than those who haven't. And you know, just yesterday, I, I want to be completely honest with you, just yesterday, um, I was talking with someone about um, a friend of mine who actually uh, was a Christian and, and has left the faith and is no longer a Christian. And she was telling me that uh, the reason that he left the Christian faith is because he saw hypocrisy because he saw the way that people were living their lives and he thought it's not worth it. And I don't know what, um, I don't know what side of the fence you stand on, whether you're a Christian, whether you call yourself a follower of Jesus or not, but either way, you probably got to agree with me. That's sad. That's sad. And I wonder about you. I wonder what your experience of Christianity has been. Maybe you're someone who grew up in a Christian home. Maybe you attended a Christian school. Maybe you just have Christian friends or, or maybe none of those things, but you're just interested, I guess. You're just uh, intrigued to hear a little bit more about spirituality. I don't know what it is for you. And I don't even know who you are watching this video, but there is one thing I reckon I know about you. And that is that if you have lived long enough, you have encountered hypocrisy in your life. You have come across two-faced people. People who live their lives in such a way that is selfish, that is immature, that, that hurts people, that actually um, um, undermines the dignity of other people, but not just other people. It actually undermines their own dignity as well and compromises their own integrity. And you've seen that and you wish there was another way. You think, I wish there was another way. If only there was another way, because this isn't it. This isn't it. 
And let me tell you, unless if a desirable and attractive alternative is presented to young people, and they're going to continue to fall for the same stupid things that the generation and the generation before them did. And so we have to address this generation. We have to address this generation because it is a generation of people who feel insecure in their identity. It is a generation of people whose identity is fragmented. And so that's what this series is about. We're starting a new series that we've titled Regeneration. And we're looking at the idea that maybe there is another way. Maybe there is another way, a regenerated way to live our lives. You know, in the New Testament, uh, in the Bible, we actually read several letters from the Apostle Paul where he is in um, correspondence with, with the next generation of Jesus followers. And uh, Paul was a very prolific man. He, he was in communication with several churches throughout Asia and Europe. And uh, because of that, and, and I guess just because of history, um, we don't actually have all of the letters that he wrote, but we do have some documented. And uh, the one we're going to look at together today is recorded in the Bible as the book of 2 Corinthians. So we only have two of these letters, but uh, 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 reality is it's suggested that there was at least four letters. There was at least four letters that Paul sent out in correspondence with the Corinthians, but we're just going to look at 2 Corinthians today. So if you allow me, let's look at it together now. It says this, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So the people of Corinth, uh, they were a very intellectual society. They valued competency and aptitude. They valued skill. They valued knowledge. And uh, they were probably very decisive, or, or some people would say stubborn, um, in, in, their, in their set of beliefs. And for Paul, who was someone who was trying to uh, change their culture, uh, they were probably a very difficult people group to reach. But this wasn't Paul's first rodeo. He had come and he had established a, a, a community of, of, of believers. He had established a church and he had shared the message of the gospel. He had shared the good news of Jesus. And then he had uh, moved on his way to carry on his mission elsewhere. Because for Paul, that was kind of his... Um, that was his method of doing ministry, I guess, that he would spend some time with one group of people and then do the same thing elsewhere with another group of people. But we read a time in the, in the relationship between Paul and the Corinthians where it's actually fragmented. And the Corinthians are beginning to question Paul's legitimacy. They're beginning to question his identity. They're maybe even beginning to think that this man, Paul, might actually be a man of hypocrisy. Because you see, during Paul's absence, uh, there were, were new leaders had begun to emerge in the church. And these people were false teachers. These people were corrupt people who, who spread a different version of Christianity to the one that Paul promoted. And these people came with letters of recommendation. They came with, with um, uh, credentials they were people who were highly esteemed. They were highly reputable. And so because of their influence, the church of Corinth began to think that maybe if Paul doesn't have one of these letters, then maybe he isn't our guy. Maybe he's not the real deal. And can you imagine how insulting and just baffling that must have been for Paul? Because here's the guy who literally poured out his heart. He poured out his heart for these people to establish this church. And, and, and now in his absence, they begin to question him, not just as a leader, but as a man of God. They begin to question his spiritual authority. Can you imagine how that would feel? 
And here's the thing. Paul had the credentials. In his previous way of life, Paul was a very religious man. He was what, what they were referred to as a Pharisee, which is someone who, you know, um, for, for those of us who are Christians, who call ourselves Christians, we, maybe we find it difficult to read the Bible like, I don't know, every day. We find it difficult to read the Bible once a week or something, right? But these guys from a very young age, they actually had to begin to memorize and recite the Torah, so Paul had the knowledge, he had the know-how, and not only that, he was actually the best of the best of the best. He was the best. He had the credentials for what he needed. And not even looking at his past, if you just look at who Paul was during this time, he was a man who was renowned for being passionate about Jesus. He was a man who was being uh, renowned for being sold out for sharing the message of Jesus. So he had the credentials. But what's amazing in this passage is not the way that Paul chooses to defend himself. What's amazing is the way he tries to shift the focus to a new identity. Because he cares deeply about these people, he wants to show them that maybe there is a better way than this. He wants to show them that maybe there is a way of doing life that brings freedom. Maybe there is a better way of doing life that brings hope. Maybe there's a way of doing life that brings significance and inspiration to us. And it is a regenerated way of doing life. So Paul goes on. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away, but their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains whenever the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And I know I just read like a huge slab of text, and, and I apologize for that. Um, look, for your sake and for my sake, we're going to keep it simple, okay? So Paul talks about two different things. He talks about two different kinds of ministries. And by that, he's actually referring to the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And so the Old Covenant is something that God had laid the groundworks for uh, during the days of, of Abraham. And he had actually began to initiate during the time of Moses. And what the Old Covenant was, it, if you like, it was like a, a contract. It was an agreement between God and his people that, that if the people were to obey God, if they were to honor God uh, in being obedient to him, then he would actually bless them and uh, he would prosper them and he would make Israel the number one nation. He would make them the premier nation in the land. But if you know anything about people, as you might suspect, the people weren't able to keep their end of the deal. And so what ended up happening is that old covenant was temporary. It was temporary. It was a temporary fix, but it didn't resolve the problem of sin in our lives. But when Jesus came, he came to fulfill the old covenant. He came to introduce a new covenant between God and his people. And that covenant is that, 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 that if you receive that version, if you receive that 
regenerated version of yourself. It's not that you just get a ticket to heaven. It's like, woohoo, I just I get to go to heaven. You actually receive a new way of being. You receive a new identity. You receive a regenerated identity. And what is that identity? We actually become transformed into the image of Christ. And so that's why Paul says a little later in Corinthians, he says that if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And what's fascinating about this is that it says that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. As soon as you receive Jesus, as soon as you receive Jesus and you turn from from your previous way, from the old way of life, you receive a new ministry, you receive a new covenant, you receive a new identity, a regenerated identity in Jesus that allows your life to echo the life of Jesus to those around you. Your identity changes. And what might surprise you But I think if you were to give it some thought, maybe you would actually agree with me. Is that just because you're doing something different, just because you know something different, it doesn't necessarily result in being different. Just because you know something, just because you do something different, doesn't mean you you become different. Think about it this way. If I were to... um, Imagine I began to play football, and this is an imaginary scenario because it's it's not believable. Uh, Imagine I began to play football, right? And I began to research as much as I could about football. I, I just developed my knowledge, right? Well, let me ask you, does that mean that I become an AFL football player? Not necessarily, not necessarily. Just because you're doing something different and just because you know something, it doesn't mean that you change as a person. Your activity doesn't change. Your, your, your identity doesn't change based on your activity. It's actually the other way around. It's the other way around. And that's what, um, it's actually something my mentor used to say to me. He said um, that, Duncan, your, your possibility determines your activity. Your possibility. In other words, the possible version of you. The version of you that you dream about, that you aspire to, the ideal version of you, that the person that you've always wanted to be, that version of you determines where your energy goes. That determines the amount of energy you're, ele- you're, you're willing to put into the activity to get there. Your possibility determines your activity. And so I wonder that maybe the reason that some of us feel insecure in our identity is because maybe we never thought of ourselves that way. Maybe you're even a Christian and you've never seen yourself as the regenerated version of you. And I want to invite you, would you begin to believe that? And maybe for those of you who are followers of Jesus, maybe that means you have to spend some time in repentance. And spend some time saying to God, Lord, I want to live the regenerated version of my life again. Maybe I wouldn't be perfect, but I would be being perfected. I want to to do that way of life again. I want to receive a new way of being that will completely change my identity. I want to receive a better way of being. Because let me tell you, The messenger of Christ's letter shares the message of a life that is better. The messenger of Christ's letter carries a message of a life that is better. And you would always choose better. You would always choose better. If you had had the option between something that's, "Eh, it's pretty good, or it's, better, it's exponentially better, you would always choose better. And that's what Paul is saying here. You have your old way of life. It was pretty good. It had its, it had its moment. It had its, stuff, its time, but ultimately it wasn't going to last. 
or you can live as the regenerated you, the new you, the Jesus you. So what do you want your life to communicate? If, if your life was a letter, what do you want your life to communicate? Because everyone's life communicates something. And you want it to be, do you want people to see your credentials? Do you want people to see how much you know, how smart you are? Do you want people to see how popular you are? Do you want people to see how you've always got the best things, you've, you've got the best stuff, you're living the good life, but you know and I know that, that that version of the good life is a myth. Or do you want your life to, con to, to communicate sincerity and righteousness? That people would see the way that, sh that you interact with people with such courteousness and such consideration and humility that you would be pointing them to a life that is better. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, I, I, I don't want to offend anyone, but, but I dare say this, that you will never live the regenerated life unless if you allow the Holy Spirit to move inside of you. You will always be confronted with your old way of doing life. You will always be confronted with your old nature, your imperfect nature. But there is a way that's better. And we invite you to that. We invite you to the life of, of Jesus that is, that is a message, a letter of a life that is better. Hey, thank you everyone for um, joining us this week. This has been uh, the first of, of a series that we're going to be doing now for the, uh, for the next little while. And, um, you know, if, if you weren't happy with uh, th this message, well, don't worry. I think hopefully we're going to get some other young adults to share with you as well. So um, tune in then and uh, we hope to see you there. All right. Take care, everyone. <laughs>